Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be covering uh, cardiac disorders. This is part two for the nurse practitioner student. Now, if you are a PN, VN, RN student, you can still watch this video. It will still be helpful uh, for you to know this information. However, I made it specifically for the NP student. Again, this is cardiac disorders. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it. Go ahead and give it a thumbs up now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already and be sure to check out my website. Be sure to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. So many resources there are available for you. You can sign up for a private one-on-one -on -one tutoring session with me, or maybe you just want to pick my brain about something. You can uh, sign up for a consultation session. Uh, there are audio lessons available. If you're a current nursing student, you're really struggling. You have to do really well on your next exam. See if I have an audio lesson that matches your upcoming exam. And of course, uh, my Nexus Nursing Test Bank, which I'm hoping by the time this video comes up, comes out, it will be published. Um, I'm working very closely with uh, my engineers uh, to get this out and published for you. So watch out for that. Um, this is going to be a great program for students who are studying for their boards and kind of feel like they're all over the place because there's so much to study, kind of narrows things down on the important things that you need to know. So be sure to check that out again, my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. My handle is the same everywhere. I want to start off before we start uh, with a prayer. If you're not into that, no need to send me hate mail. Just fast forward. That's all you got to do. Um, if you are not operating heavy machinery, please close your eyes, bow your heads. Father God, thank you, Lord, for another day on this earth. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies. Thank you for every single viewer, listener, subscriber. Father God, thank you for this platform that you've allowed me to have. Lord, thank you for letting me be able to reach everyone that is watching and listening. Lord, I ask that you please help me to deliver this information in a way that the students can understand, that they can remember, Father God, that they can process when they're seeing these same topics again, Lord, that they can think critically and answer the question correctly. Father God, I pray over every single watcher, every single viewer right now, for whatever reason they came to this channel, Lord, I ask that you please bless them. I ask that you please help them to succeed and reach their goals and allow them to be a blessing for others. Thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do in our lives. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question, which of the following ECG changes is most indicative of myocardial infarction? A, ST segment depression, B, ST segment elevation, C, prolonged PR interval, or D, peaked, peaked P waves? Okay, very good. I know you guys all got this correct. The correct answer is the ST uh, segment elevation. That's your STEMI. But you need to know the others, okay? For testing purposes, you better know A, B, and C. So let's talk about it. A, ST segment um, depression. Where do we see that in ischemia? C, prolonged PR interval. What does that suggest? AV block. And then D, peaked P waves. What does that suggest? Right atrial enlargement. Make sure you know all four of these, okay? A patient presents with acute heart failure. Which medication should be avoided? A, metoprolol, B, furosemide, C, lisinopril, or D, carvedilol? What do you think? And the correct answer, guys, is a metoprolol. So they're telling us that this patient has heart failure, what medication is going to be contraindicated, it's a metoprolol. Um, you need to understand that uh, this beta blocker, um, it decreases the contractility of the heart. Why is that a problem? Think about it. The patient has heart failure. There's way too much fluid. The heart's in fluid overload. Pretend like this is the heart. It's supposed to be pumping like this, but all of this fluid is causing it pump like this, right? It can't get all that fluid out. The contractility, this right here, has gone down because it's too much fluid, right? And now you're gonna give them a metoprolol that makes that contractility even worse? Absolutely not, it's gonna make the heart failure worse, right? That's why we love digoxin so much because you give that patient the digoxin to heart failure, it does what? The opposite, it increases the car, um, contractility. It's cardiac glycoside, increases the contractility, makes the heart um, um, contract even stronger to push out all that fluid. So we're not gonna give metoprolol. Now furosemide, um, that, decreases the fluid overload. So a patient with heart failure, um, 
that is something you'd expect to prescribe for that patient. Um, lisinopril, you also, if this patient um, has had heart failure long-term, this is something that would be beneficial for the patient with long-term um, heart failure. You may prescribe that for uh, long-term. And carvedilol, here's the thing, this is for chronic heart failure, but for like an acute exacerbation, absolutely not. So carvedilol you may prescribe, but that would be for chronic, not for an acute exacerbation. And the question was asking us, which one would we avoid? So all three, um, may potentially be given uh be subscribed to subscribe be prescribed to the patient depending on the condition so when you guys are reading um not the case study but the actual um uh, question where they give you the situation of the patient it makes a difference if they tell you that the patient's in acute exacerbation or this patient's had heart failure for um over a year or um that uh the heart failure is getting worse. Like you have to look at the context of the situation to figure out, okay, what you're going to prescribe for this patient. It makes a big difference. Okay. Now, uh, next question, which valvular disorders characterized by a mid systolic click here, are your options, aortic stenosis, mitral valve prolapse, aortic regurgitation, tricuspid stenosis, mid systolic click. What do you guys think? And the correct answer is B, mitral valve prolapse. So what happens due to those leaflets not closing the way they're supposed to, um, you hear that mid-systolic click. When you see that phrase, mid-systolic click, I want you to think of mitral valve prolapse. But guess what? You got to know the other options too, because I didn't write your exam. You might see the other options. Let's talk about it. A, aortic stenosis. With aortic stenosis, you would hear a crescendo decrescendo. De crescendo decrescendo murmur okay so when you hear or you see that um that description i want you to think of aortic stenosis aortic regurgitation you'd hear a diastolic murmur um tricuspid stenosis you'd also hear diastolic murmur as well now here's the difference with the choice d tricuspid stenosis yes you'd also hear um uh, diastolic murmur. However, for testing purposes, they usually give you more of a description and I want you to write this down because they'll let you know that it's low pitched and it's best heard in the left sternal border. Okay. And here's something about this last one. Um, it intensifies with inspiration with tricuspid stenosis. So yes, you'll hear um, a diastolic murmur, but also you'll get that um, description most likely. Again, low pitched, best heard, um, less sternal border, and intensifies with inspiration. A patient with chronic hypertension develops a left ventricular hypertrophy. What is the main cause? Increased preload, increased afterload, decreased contractility, or valvular regurgitation. And guys, the correct answer is B, increased afterload. Let's go back to the question. Look what it says. It says the patient has what? Chronic hypertension. Guys, this increases the afterload. It forces the left ventricle to work harder, leading to what? The hypertrophy. That's the correct answer, increased afterload. Make sure you understand the pathophysiology. Make sure you understand why. All right, which cardiac enzyme remains elevated the longest after myocardial infarction? A, troponin, B, CKNB, C, myoglobin, or D, LDH? Which cardiac enzyme remains elevated the longest after the patient's had an MI, after they've had a heart attack? And guys, the correct answer is A, the tropes. They'll stay elevated for about 10 days to two weeks, 10 to 14 days. Now you have to know about uh, your other options. You've got to know about the CKMB. Uh, this becomes normalized in about 48 hours, two days. Myoglobin, this rises quickly, but it's also nonspecific because you could see myoglobin in any muscle damage. It doesn't have to be particularly the heart. And then uh, DLDH, this is much, matter of fact, this is the less specific, um, this is less specific than the tropes or the others, okay? 
What's the initial treatment for symptomatic bradycardia? A, amiodarone, B, epinephrine, C, atropine, D, aden adenosine. They ask about all four on the state board exams, AANC and AANP. So make sure you know all four. Don't say I didn't warn you. All right, the correct answer is A, atropine. Go back to the question, what does the patient have? Bradycardia. What does atropine do? It increases the heart rate, okay? Increases um, the heart rate by, um, oh my gosh, I'm sorry guys, it's been a long day and I'm drinking coffee and it's not working. Um, what is the action of atropine? I know it increases the heart rate, but how does it do it? Atropine. Blocking the vagus nerve. I'm sorry, it took me a second. By blocking the vagus nerve, that's how it does it. Um, Professor D, do I have to know uh, the action? Yes, you do. That's what I'm talking about it, okay? Other um, options, okay, we have um, amiodarone. What do we give amiodarone for? You need to know this, we give it for ventricular arrhythmias. Epinephrine. Now, here's the thing. With symptomatic bradycardia, if atropine was not here, we would have chose epinephrine. Okay? Uh, that is a viable option. However, um, if you have the option between the two and atropine's there, you're going to give atropine first. Then epinephrine. This is our second um, line go-to after atropine. Both AANC and AANP, they are very, very big on first line treatment. So I'm telling you right now, while you're studying in your textbook, whenever you see anything that says first line treatment, first line drug, highlight it, underline it, put a star next to it, you need to know it. They are very big on preventative measures and first line treatment, okay? So anyway, epinephrine would have been number two. And our last option, adenosine, we give this for um, SVT. If the patient's got supraventricular uh, tachycardia, then you'd expect to order that. A patient uh, presents with chest pain relieved by nitroglycerin. What is the likely di diagnosis? Myocardial infarction, unstable angina, stable angina, pericarditis. Another way that you may see this as a question, they may tell you that your patient comes into the primary care office and you evaluate them and they have, um, well, if I tell you, if I describe this to you, you're going to know what the answer is. Let me tell you what the answer is and I'll tell you what the question may look like on your exam. So the correct answer, guys, is uh, C, stable angina. Why? It's predictable it's relieved by nitroglycerin. Now let's go back to how you may get a question. You may get a description of a patient that comes into your office and they get angina, but they notice that they know when they're going to get angina. So they know they get angina when they garden or they know they get angina when they walk up 10. When, when you say flight of stairs, is it the whole thing of stairs or each step is a flight of stairs? I'm not sure. So I don't want to say flight of stairs, but they tell you the, they'll get the chest pain, um, after they go over 10 steps. Like, so they, they, they know what causes it because uh, when they perform those actions causes it, but whenever they stop that activity, the pain goes away. That's what? Stable angina. So the question will describe stable angina, but it won't use that phrase stable angina. And then they're gonna ask you um, what you're gonna order for that patient and what, you, what your answer is gonna be, the nitroglycerin. So that's how they flip it. Even if they flip it, you, if you understand the information, you'll still get the correct answer, okay? Um, now let's talk about the other options. Myocardial infarction, what's that? That's a heart attack. Um, unstable angina. Unlike stable angina where it's predictable where they stop that activity and the pain goes away, unstable angina, it's not predictable. They don't know when it's gonna come on, at the, what activity will cause it. And then when they stop that activity, still doesn't go, go away. It's not relieved by nitro, by the way. And then pericarditis, that's inflammation of the pericardium. And with pericarditis, it's important to know, not only that it's inflammation of the pericardium, it gets worse when that patient lies down. 
A wide fixed split of the S2 heart sound is characteristic of which position? A, septal, atrial septal defect. B, ventricular septal defect. C, aortic stenosis. Or D, pulmonary hypertension. You know what I notice? When I'm tired or um, angry, my speech worsens. I'm sorry, guys. All right, so the correct answer is A, a uh, atrial septal atrial septal defect okay so let's go back to the question here's the description they gave us wide fixed split of s2 heart sound when you see this your brain needs to go to asd atrial septal defect this is created from that left to right shunting of blood okay that leads to uh right uh heart volume overload and then you have that split s2 make sure you know that description which medication is contraindicated in heart failure with reduced ejection fracture? Spironolactone, deltiazam, lisinopril, valsartan. By the way, all those options, you need to know the drug classes for them. And guys, the correct answer is uh, uh, B, deltiazam, because of its negative inotropic effect, okay? Matter of fact, um, for this question, when they're asking about which medication would be contraindicated in heart failure with reduced ejection fracture, go ahead and add um, verapamil to that list. You need to know that for testing purposes. Calcium channel blocker. blocker. Okay, last question, guys. A water hammer pulse is associated with which condition? Aortic regurgitation, mitral stenosis, or tricuspid regurgitation? I guess there's no A. And the correct answer is B, aortic regurgitation. So go, let's go back to the question. They're talking about water hammer pulse. When you see that description, I want you to think of aortic regurgitation. So what happened is um, it causes a bounding forceful pulse because of what? Rapid runoff. Okay, rapid runoff of blood from the aorta into the left ventricle, and that's what's causing it. Make sure you can recognize it. And guys, I know this was a short video, but that is it for part two, uh, cardiac disorders. Part three cardiac disorders should be coming up in a couple weeks and because I'm trying to be fair and go in rotation. So we do PNVN, RN, then NP. PNVN, RN, then NP. So uh, um, cardiac disorders part three should be coming soon. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.